Good. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for showing up so early. It's about uh, midnight California time. So for me, it's late. Uh, but for you as students, I realize it's early. So I do have a few slides to kick off, which are mostly because these have pictures that I did not trust myself to draw on the board, uh, including some actual experimental data. But where we're going today is to try to answer at least the first few of these questions. Uh, I don't know if we'll get to number four, but if not, we'll get to it tomorrow. So question number one, I wrote down this wave function, and I said it has a couple of nice properties, and we'll hear more, but I haven't yet said why this is a reasonable guess for the ground state of interacting electrons in the lowest Landau level at density one-third of the Landau level. Um, so we'll give a quick picture due to Haldane that I think makes the wave function a lot more believable. And then for two and three, we're actually going to go back to one particle physics. Uh, question two is about, from what I've said so far, we said that the Landau level had this funny kind of pumping, where if I imagine a big Landau level and I punch a hole in the center and I pump flux, then the states in the Landau level kind of move outward. Remember, at any fixed flux, the Landau level eigenstates, we can think of them like rings in this rotationally symmetric basis. So something about the way the Landau level behaves is that a little bit of extra flux in that solenoid made the rings moved outward, which was pumping in Laughlin's version. So what was it that was special? Because it's true that if we took an ordinary band insulator and no magnetic field and drilled a solenoid and tried to pump flux, nothing would really happen very much to the states of the insulator. So there is something special about the Landau level. Uh, and how could we make a band insulator that would behave like a Landau level? And this actually is one of the ways to understand what Thoulis and collaborators did to give kind of a different picture of the integer Hall effect. And their picture, one thing that is useful about it is you can then ask, are there materials with no magnetic field that would have some kind of topological state, and also what's an easy way to handle disorder. And then the last question will maybe be easier to understand once I show a couple of slides, because I can tell you uh, the thing that when I learned about it made me want to be a condensed matter physicist when I was in graduate school, I think, because uh, we're going to try to do something similar for our kind of phase, uh, topological phases. So let's go back to if you want normal phases, like symmetry breaking phases, which is most of condensed matter. Uh, so for example, diamond has a lattice, that lattice has a lot of symmetries. I don't know if it's easy to turn off the lights, but that might be a little helpful. Uh, the uh, diamond lattice has a lot of leftover rotations and translations, but it doesn't have the continuous rotations and translations that the vacuum does. So we classify crystals by what symmetries they have left, if you like. Uh, and that idea of symmetry breaking as a way to understand ordered phases is incredibly powerful. And on the next slide, I'll try to convince you that it's not just words or philosophy. It actually gives you some interesting numbers. Um, but just to remind you, so crystals are about rotational and translational symmetries of free space. Magnets, not only do they pick out a direction in spin space, but they actually break a kind of time reversal symmetry. Superfluids we think mostly of as a another kind of symmetry breaking related to quantum mechanics. So the reason why I say this is not just philosophy is when you take symmetry breaking and you try to encode it in theory, that's what leads you to things like Landau-Ginsberg theories, basically free energy functionals of an order parameter. And if you haven't come across this yet in, say, graduate school StatMech, then uh, maybe this will be an advertisement that you should take graduate school StatMech. Um, so let's just think about simple phase transitions. So this is one that you know. Take a fluid like water and forget about ice, which is a little complicated. So you've just got the liquid phase of water and the gas phase of water. And this is a phase transition which is just boiling. Um, but if you go well above room pressure and room temperature, then actually there is no boiling transition. You can go continuously between liquid and gas. Uh, and one thing you'll find, if you go close to the critical point where that transition disappears, that means the difference between liquid and gas across this line is disappearing, and it disappears as a power law. And that power law experimentally is you know, 0.3 something in three dimensions. If you take a bar of iron and you look at how the magnetism in iron disappears when you get to the Curie temperature of about 1,000 Kelvin, 
It also disappears as a power law, and these are very different systems. The one on the left, there's no lattice. It's classical, basically. It's atoms, which are heavy. The one on the right is electrons and a crystal, and yet you find that the way the magnetization disappears here is not just the same form, but it's even the same number. So in other words, close enough to the critical point, uh, these systems are almost identical if you ask the right question, and we call this universality at second-order phase transitions. And what it means uh, from a theory point of view is, uh, is good. It means we can be lazy. And if you like, a way, to, a way to separate physicists from the other scientists is that physicists are lazy. We want one theory to describe a lot of things rather than many different theories to describe many different things. Uh, and this is saying that if you write down the simplest possible field theory of symmetry breaking in three dimensions, you're actually you're capturing some huge variety of systems. So we're going to write down, at the end of this lecture or the beginning of the next one, the simplest topological field theory in two plus one dimensions. And it won't really have critical exponents like this, but it'll have some other neat properties. So this is kind of what we would like to do for topological phases, is find the simplest field theory that captures the important stuff and leaves aside the microscopic details. Because you can never really have the exact microscopic wave function, say, anyway. All right, so now we go to topological phases. I, I told you about the integer quantum Hall effect last time, and this is what data looks like. Uh, and this, I think, is actually not real data. I have some real data on the next slide. This may be schematic. Uh, so the red curve is the Hall resistance, and 1.0 corresponds to h over e squared. Uh, rho xx, basically the system is insulating in the diagonal direction whenever it's on one of these plateaus. This is a function of magnetic field. And what people were used to seeing before 1980 was this kind of smooth dependence on magnetic field down here that you see here at, at low fields. But if you make the field larger, you get these regions. And these are the things that I said were actually incredibly flat. Uh, the value in the central part of a plateau is any squared over h to something like one part in 10 to the ninth. Um, and uh, if you make a very clean sample, then you don't just see e squared over h or 2e squared over h. You see these many little plateaus in a clean sample. Uh, and they correspond to densities that are many different odd denominator fractions. And a question you can ask me in discussion is, where do these other states all come from? Uh, the one we focused on, because it's a very strong plateau, and it's maybe the simplest one to understand, is one third. You don't need a lot more to understand these, but uh, because I don't want this to be an entire mini course on the Hall effect, I think I'll skip why there are these other plateaus. But they're all pretty interesting. Um, there are even a couple of plateaus with even denominators, which are probably the most interesting of all. So there's one thing I'm going to tell you later on about the Laughlin wave function. Uh, it turns out that it realizes a concept that theorists had figured out around 1976 uh, in Norway, I believe, uh, which is that one of the things you learned as a graduate student, this thing about there being only bosons and fermions, is not quite true. So I'll tell you why, in principle, it's not true. And then we'll see that the Laughlin wave function is an example that it's not true. Uh, so there's kind of a hidden assumption the way we normally talk about particle statistics of identical particles in quantum mechanics. Uh, the assumption is, OK, well, if I want to, say, measure statistics, uh, I can imagine, let's say I exchange two particles. Uh, do I get a plus one, which would be bosons? Or do I get a minus one, which would be fermions? Or do I get something else? Uh, and what you find with a kind of simple analysis, it looks like you can only get plus one or minus one. Uh, and the assumption that was made in that analysis is, uh, in mathematical terms, it's saying that statistics is related to the permutation group. The permutation group is you're given some labels of the particles, and you switch them around, and you have no information about the history of how that happened. So the precise mathematical statement would be, the, would be that in three dimensions, we think that statistics of point-like particles is given by representations of the permutation group. And the permutation group is pretty simple. It's got basically bosons and fermions. In two dimensions, well, if you were really going to try to do an exchange experiment, you'd have to move the particles around each other. And in two dimensions, there's actually a topological difference between moving the particles around each other clockwise 
and moving them around each other counterclockwise. Basically, imagine fixing one particle and moving the other one around it in a loop. In two dimensions, this loop and that loop, there's no way to connect them. If I'm in a three-dimensional world, then moving it this way, I could imagine lifting the loop up, flipping it over, and putting it back down. So Linus and Merheim sort of realized that in 2D, maybe you could have a system of particles where what phase you got on exchanging particles was sensitive to whether you move them around each other clockwise or counterclockwise. And in the simplest case, which is what happens in the Laughlin state, when we exchange two of these fractionally charged quasi-particles, we're not going to get a plus one or a minus one, which would be bosons or fermions. We're going to get a phase factor like that. And then there's a lot of work nowadays, which I don't think we'll get to in this little course, on uh, non-abelian statistics, where you can't even write the statistics as a single complex number. Uh, you can ask me questions about that maybe at the end of the last lecture if you want a quick definition. So. I think, uh, let me say one or two things more. Again, I have some pictures on the next slide or two. But first, this is kind of to review uh, some things I said last time in slightly different language. So the reason why people normally measure the Hall effect, like what they thought they were looking for in the two-dimensional electron system, was that if you measure the current along x divided by the voltage along y in magnetic field, in a simple semi-classical picture, you get the inverse of the density of particles, uh, whether they're electrons or holes, the charge and the speed of light. And then if you convert that back to what is sigma xy, it would be that combination divided by b. So what does it mean? What was the original interpretation of seeing sigma xy equal to any squared over h? Well, it's like saying that the density is somehow fixed at exactly some number of filled Landau levels and then whatever other states there are don't contribute. So you could kind of look at what we got about the integer Hall effect as saying it's almost like there's a quantization of the density of levels that matter. So that's why people kind of knew there would be bumps, but it doesn't give you this very precise quantization that is seen experimentally. For that, you need something like Laughlin's argument. Um, so I think the last thing I want to show you is a couple of pictures because we're about to start talking about actual topology as a sense of uh, mathematics. So here's the simplest kind of topology I know to picture, and it turns out to be very relevant by what we do uh, to what we do for question two up there. Uh, so one way to get something topological in physics is to start with geometry. We have a lot of geometry, and then to do it sort of globally, like say, combine the geometry at all the points of a surface. And here's a famous example, which is mathematically a tiny bit similar to the way it's going to work for our electrons. If I take two-dimensional surfaces and three-dimensional space, at every point on one of these surfaces, there are two directions of curvature, or let me make them radii of curvature. And the Gaussian curvature is one over their, their product with the following sign convention. We say that the sphere has positive Gaussian curvature the hyperboloid has negative Gaussian curvature because if you like one curvature is toward me and one is away from me, they have different senses. And a cylinder has zero Gaussian curvature because the vertical radius is infinite. So the magic happens when I take this kind of natural geometric quantity. Uh, you can tell it's natural because Gauss already knew about it. And I integrate it over the whole surface. So let's try it for the sphere. So the sphere has surface area 4 pi r squared. The Gaussian curvature is 1 over r squared, so the integral is 4 pi. The magic is that if you take the sphere and you make it an egg or a football or whatever, it's not only independent of the radius, it's actually invariant of the shape as long as the shape is continuously connected to being a sphere. But if I took a donut, the donut will have positive curvature on the outside, negative curvature on the inside, and the total curvature is actually 0. So the mathematical statement is that the total curvature of a closed two-dimensional surface is like 2 pi times some integer, uh, basically 2 minus 2 times the number of holes where the donut has one hole. Um, so integrating in, in physics language, you could say that the total curvature of a surface is quantized, but it's not always the same. There are different topological classes. Um, so we're going to make something like that out of wave functions in a crystal uh, quite soon. Uh, and the one fact that I hope you've seen before 
because I'm going to assume it, is that when you put an electron in a crystal, you can write its wave function in a form which is a plane wave times a part which is periodic with the same periodicity as the crystal. Uh, we call this Bloch's theorem. So the momentum that appears here doesn't live in the whole plane. It lives in the, the Brillouin zone, which is effectively a d-dimensional torus. And that's going to be the surface. We need to make a curvature out of the wave functions and integrate it over the Brillouin zone. And that's going to lead to the Berry phase in solid state physics, which turns out to have been about 40 years worth of research and understanding all the things that's good for. And that's going to be the main subject of the second part of today's lecture. That's kind of question two will lead us to that. So I'm going to write up a couple of formulas. And I will, I think, write these up later. Um, but just in case it goes by too quickly, uh, let me write this one slide. Um, basically, if you give me Bloch's theorem, and I'll say more about where these come from. I mean, I'll try to maybe not exactly derive, but I'll at least motivate these more. But in case uh, you just want to write down some key facts or kind of sort of know what's important when we get to it later on, this is Bloch's theorem. I can make a kind of gauge field, and we'll explain why it's a gauge field later on, out of the Bloch states in a crystal and how they depend on momentum. So this is like a U1 gauge field, sort of like electromagnetism, but it lives in the Brillouin zone. It lives in momentum space. And I can make objects out of it that are gauge invariant, like the curl of A, which would normally be the field strength, is now what we call the Berry curvature. And the first appearance of that in solid state physics was actually Thaulis's picture of why Laughlin was right, which was that if I integrate the Berry curvature over bands, I get a magic integer, a topological integer kind of like the total curvature. And it tells me how much that band contributes when I fill it to the Hall effect. So this is kind of where we're going. I don't expect this to make sense right now. But I thought since I had this slide, I would show it. Basically, there's a topological invariant called churn number of two-dimensional bands.